It seems appropriate as we convene on the eve of the centennial anniversary of the Organic Act that established the National Park Service in 1916 that we refamiliarize ourselves with the enabling purpose for which National Park Service were managed, to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such a manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. However, before I nest the foundations of today's discourse in Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. and the Organic Act, I'd like to go back to the elder Olmsted and a revealing letter from Olmsted to William Hammond Hall and the designer and superintendent, of course, of Golden Gate Park that was sent some 45 years earlier. Quote, I have given the matter of pleasure grounds for San Francisco some consideration and fully realize the difficulties of your undertaking. Indeed, I may say that I do not believe it practicable to meet the natural but senseless demands of unreflecting people bred in the Atlantic states and north of Europe for what is technically termed a park under the climatic conditions of San Francisco. One of the things we were talking about yesterday at Alcatraz is how often this issue of climate comes up again and again over the decades and centuries. It's fascinating to me that Olmsted brushed off this query so casually, having been engaged at Berkeley and Yosemite in the previous decade, and that same year he and John Charles Olmsted would spend time in the California foothills. Perhaps it was because Olmsted was busy in many cities by this point, and by the next decade, Olmsted, as well as Charles Eliot, Warren Manning, Frank Waugh, and other New Englanders would broaden their understanding of cultural landscapes as chronicled in the publication Garden and Forest. So it's all been digitized. It's at the Library of Congress. It was published for a decade. It had no advertising. And it really is the origins of today's discussion. As landscape historian Ethan Carr has noted, the journal boasted that landscape architecture was not limited to the, quote, planting of flower beds and of ornamental shrubs. The Garden and Forest editors asserted but was a broad and Catholic art, as useful as the preservation of the Yosemite Valley or the scenery of Niagara, as it is to the planning of a pastoral park or the grounds around a country house. Relevant to this discourse, Garden and Forest also introduced the idea of a shared value system for landscapes by actively promoting the creation of the first private nonprofit conservation organization of its kind in the US, the Trustees of Reservations, initially referred to as public reservations. Mining the ideas of Garden and Forest today, one can readily understand the founding principles and mission-driven aspirations that the trustees would pursue and, relevant to today's discourse, are echoed in many of the abstracts for today's speakers. So indulge me while I revisit the March 5, 1890 letter by Eliot, published in Garden and Forest. Eliot, like the elder Olmsted, that had recognized by, that by the end of the 19th century, conservationists had succeeded in protecting many of the natural wonders of the American West but densely populated eastern seaboard communities had received little attention. For example, in Boston, population of over about 450,000 at that time, compared to here, 300,000, had become the nation's fourth largest manufacturing center. And yet against this backdrop of industrialization, very little had been done to set aside open space. And Eliot believed that large parks, such as Prospect Park in New York and Franklin Park in Boston, would provide fresh air, scenic beauty, and opportunities for individual quiet repose. It was in a seminal letter that Eliot revealed his vision for the preservation of what he called special bits of scenery that should be protected and how to accomplish this. For those of you um, that are not familiar with the before and afters by Eliot, one of the kind of fun things, if you look in the corner here, it says A squared S. These drawings were done by Arthur Shercliffe, who would go on to do Colonial Williamsburg. This was then a 20-something-year-old Shercliffe apprenticing in the Olmsted office. Now, the statewide nonprofit organization, essentially a corporation that would be governed by a board of voluntary trustees who would be empowered by the state legislature to hold land free of taxes for the public to enjoy, just as a public library holds books and an art museum holds pictures. Eliot's strategy, enlist a distinguished group of citizens to help this approach. In a circular called The Preservation of Beautiful and Historical Places, the group established its mission and the reasons why places of historical interest or remarkable beauty should be withdrawn from private ownership, preserved from harm, and open to the public. Eliot's foundational principles, which have already played out here in the West, recognize that lovers of nature will rally to endow the trustees with the care of their favorite scenes, precisely as the lovers of art have so liberally endowed art museums. The results, 
In the spring of 1891, the legislature approved to establish the trustees for the purposes of acquiring, holding, maintaining, and opening to the public beautiful and historical places within the Commonwealth. Eliot's approach and strategy was quick to take flight, and Garden and Forest was there to broadcast his ideas of holistic stewardship to a verse professional community, namely, the balancing of natural, scenic, and cultural values, what Eliot called history or oldie times. Uh, this was a group that sort of spun off from them, and I love their brochure at that time. This is the American Scenic and Historic Preservation Society. The back of their brochure, you'll note, has two scale, New York City's Flatiron Building, and a California Redwood. Saving nature in a humanized world, we're on a parallel track with that of the Elder Olmsted and his successor firm, as exemplified in their concurrent work on scenic reservations, such as Niagara Falls and Essex County Parks in New Jersey, country place estates exemplified by Biltmore and its own pioneering self-sufficient working farm and fully integrated horticulture, forestry, and land management programs, and park systems in Boston, Louisville, Rochester, and Seattle. These were places for all people to engage with the broader cultural landscape. Olmsted stated in his 1873 discourse on Central Park, quote, assistance should be given to visitors as is necessary to their profitable use of the park. Those most needing assistance in the way of directions, information, advice will be people of homekeeping habits, retiring dispositions, helpless, sensitive, modest. The difficulty here is not in supplying all necessary advice that shall be asked, but in giving those most needing to obtain advice the confidence to ask and accept what they need. Just like interpretation today. A century after Olmsted made his, this revealing statement as part of a movement known as Parks to People, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area was established by Congress. By this time, the landscape architect Lawrence Halperin was well established in the Bay Area. This is actually a self-portrait Larry did in 47, soon after his arrival. And he had already designed or planned a variety of downtown public spaces, humanized places animated with people, which in his words, celebrated the kaleidoscope of life found in the city. Among his Bay Area portfolio, Ghirardelli Chocolate Factory, Embarcadero, Market Street, um, all of these in addition to the revolutionary plan for Sonoma County coastline of Sea Ranch in 1962. Specifically, it was at Sea Ranch that Halpern would not only advance Elliott's and Olmsted's shared value approach, but catapult forward the idea of a development-based plan that is underpinned by sound ecological principles. One may even suggest that Halpern's quest at Sea Ranch is akin to the Golden Gate National Park Conservancy's own mission to build a community dedicated to the conserving of parks for the future. At Sea Ranch, Halpern aimed to instill value and engage the Sea Ranch community while employing planning and design strategies that would result in little impact or intrusion to what he called the native environment. In my visits with the Halperns at Sea Ranch over the last decades of Larry's life, Larry would reflect how much time he spent in the Sea Ranch landscape before the site selection process began, thus ensuring that any development was sensitively undertaken. To understand the Sea Ranch's inherent assets, Halpern camped on its beaches, chronicled its wildlife habitats, studied its wind patterns and the effect of weather. Halpern even noted in his journal, one day out of three is either windy, foggy, or rainy. The other two are lovely. There's that <laughs> pesky weather again. If design decisions at Sea Ranch were in part dictated by the weather, it was equally informed by Halpern's participatory workshops. In 1968, for example, Larry and Anna conducted a series of experiments in the environment, an astonishing 24-day extravaganza in the city, in, the Kent, in Kentfield Woodlands, in Marin County, and at Sea Ranch. Its mission and outcomes were wrapped around the theme of community. As described in Take Part, Larry set out to, quote, start with a continued exploration of the individual's awareness and extend this awareness to his interaction with the environment. From here, the idea of interaction with the environment is developed. Next comes group interaction with the environment, which ultimately leads to the development of understanding of larger communities. So as we peel back explore and debate the nature-culture relationship today in the region and the role of public participation and engagement that plays out at such beloved places as the GGNRA, what had been the common practice of top-down design lead employed by the Olmsteads, Elliots, and others here in the West Coast would come to full flower during the 1960s. 
As Jim Burns, an alum of Halpern's Take Park Workshops, has noted, it was during this decade of self-searching exploration of root impulses as much as it was flower power and political upheaval. Reflecting on this period and the role of public engagement, Halpern would proclaim in 1968, I've become increasingly convinced of the validity and significance of the pluralistic approach to art processes and the significance of allowing art to emerge from a multiplicity of inputs which scores as guides as catalysts. In this development, the artist grows into a community guide, not a form maker, and takes his rightful place in the future society as a catalyzer and developer of peak experience rather than only a producer of products. So, Recognizing that the same drinking water that Halpern served up and we all drink today comes from the same pristine snow melts in the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir in Yosemite National Park, how does public valuation and engagement balance the park's unique historic scenic cultural assets and strive to nurture and safeguard healthy balanced ecosystems? As Chris Spence notes um, and questions, if you will, our closing panelists this afternoon, how should our professional community engage effectively with the public, particularly in a time of rapid technological, social, economic, and demographic change? The answer lies in authentic engagement that listens to and serves the needs of our entire population, not just traditional users. So let's try to address Chris's meaty question, which is at the core of our challenge and opportunities. I believe that a concise historic perspective is helpful first. This can be found in Hal Rothman's, note the title, the park that makes its own weather. This administrative history of the GGNRA from 2002 notes, if there is one genuine contribution that the US has made to the application of the principles of democracy, the most likely candidate is the national park. Prior to the Age of Enlightenment, the 18th century intellectual and ultimately social revolution that insisted individuals possess natural rights and added the concept of a relationship between governors and the governed to human affairs. The idea of a park owned and used by the people was entirely unknown. In most cultures, especially monarchies and other forms of hereditary government, parks were the provinces of the nobility and wealthy, kept and maintained for their use alone. Common people were forbidden to use designated land, sometimes on penalty of death. Many stood outside of the boundaries of such areas and looked in with envy, conscious of the wealth of natural resources and aesthetic pleasures, and equally aware of the huge price to be paid for violating the liege's prerogative. Such parks, like forests set aside for royal hunts, served as manifestations of power, markers of different standing in a society driven by social distinctions. They were also flashpoints of human tensions. Combustible, explosive, volatile, liable to change rapidly and unpredictably, especially for the worse, this can be the nature culture interface. So what happens when your park is a 200-year-old palimpsest that chronicles Native American culture, Spanish American Empire frontier, California gold rush, the evolution of the American coastal fortifications and the growth of urban San Francisco, comprises 19 separate ecosystems and is home to 1,273 plants and animal species. If this is a sampling of the park's cultural and natural resource values, how do we evaluate and manage these assets? Although they can be quantified, they do not conveniently reduce to a balance sheet or a stock index, but they do integrate into a whole greater than its parts. Adds with economic fundamentals, which has to also underpin the work of the trust today, if these basics of nature are allowed to function free from market manipulations, life will thrive. And life does flourish here for 20 million visitors each year in hundreds of ways, from horseback riding, ranger-led opportunities, bicycling, hiking, birding, and dog walking. Saving nature in a humanizing world is our third thematic conference in this ongoing nature culture dialogue series. The preceding conference organized around the stewardship of Central Park Woodlands in 2012 included Michael Boland as one of our speakers, while our inaugural one in 2010 had Cheryl Barton fresh from her work at Cavallo Point providing a West Coast perspective. In both of these previous efforts, and central to the design of today's gathering is the foundational recognition that when holistic stewardship of a cultural landscape considers its historic design intent and authenticity as a core value, change can provide continuity of design and use while yielding an enhanced power of place. 
As I hope our moderators and speakers will illustrate today, such lofty goals are not always easy, and in politically and socially media-charged situations are akin to the third rail. Take, for example, the idea of the tree hugger that nostalgically rallies around a beloved tree that has outlived its healthy lifespan or design intent, the removal of an unwelcome invasive species, such as jubata grass, which carpets much of the Marin coast, is killing off other local flora fauna, or, as Bay Nature recently reported, a group of environmentalists argue that rules don't go far enough, here we go, to protect the park's sensitive habitat and are instead calling for severely restricting commercial dog walking in Presidio. That's rough. Historically and today, there has been no shortage of goodwill or a quest for an ever-deepening knowledge of the park's stewardship. In fact, one can even suggest that over the past three decades, the Conservancy has established a reputation as a leading innovator among nonprofit conservation organizations. On behalf of my colleagues and our TCLF board, it's our pleasure to be here with the three organizational partners, the Conservancy, the Trust, and NPS, who lead by example when managing these shared value landscapes while also collectively recognizing that a diminished historic design intent with a less sustainable ecology is not the only casualty of an isolated agenda and the nature culture dilemma is not solely the domain of dog lovers and tree huggers. As we can also see from the websites of the interpretive programs of our stewards, they too are thinking bigger and addressing the uncertain effects of global warming on the park and in our lives. As the NPS website notes, quote, Although we don't know if rainfall will increase or decrease or how coastal fog may be affected, what is known is that if global warming progresses at the current predicted rates, sea levels could rise three feet or more by the end of the century, and the impact on the park's irreplaceable cultural resources, namely historic buildings and landscape features, archaeological sites and roads, are all at risk. So then, Aspiring to inform local behavior and global debates, how can naturalists, park stewards, ecologists, interpreters, landscape architects, and others introduce meaty, informative ways to craft meaningful on-site engagement? Now, the second edition, this goes back to my park service dates, of Friedman Tilden's classic, Interpreting Our Heritage. How many people here are familiar with this book? Oh, you guys, this is like, go on Amazon. It's an oldie but goodie. Published in 1967, Interpreting Our Heritage had an introductory essay penned by then NPS director George Herzog, who attempts to address such expansive challenges. Here, Herzog paraphrases the French poet and journalist Anatole France, suggesting, do not try to satisfy your vanity by teaching a great many things. Awake people's curiosity. It is enough to open minds, do not overload them. Put there just a spark. If there is some good, inflammable stuff, it will catch. With this as a simple premise, how do we make the leap to target global issues such as greenhouse gas reduction? In the face of potentially catastrophic changes, how do we educate park staff and the public about problems and solutions while developing new stewardship practices? Nina Roberts, in proposing her abstract, who is unfortunately not with us today, posed the following questions. How can we galvanize the public by cultivating stewards out of new users or potential visitors? How can we open our minds and hearts and make room to discover how others embrace nature and make meaning from their experiences? How can land managers continue to listen and learn from the very communities they're trying to serve? Knowing that understanding multiple points of view often helps dispel persistent myths about the cultural dynamics emerging in relation to natural environments, how do we leverage this knowledge in our ongoing stewardship decisions? Moving beyond the park's 37 sites, more than 130 miles of trails and myriad natural resources to a national and international stage, we need to leverage and expand the audience of those interested in bees and trees. For example, a Google search for tree cutting controversy yields over six and a half million results. But let's not stop here. Consider, for example, the implications of the recent revisions to hardiness zones by the American Horticulture Society and the National Arbor Day Foundation brought on by warmer temperatures that has resulted in the need for substitute plant materials. These challenges were illustrated in the recent New York Times article, A City Prepares for a Warm Long-Term Forecast, which notes that the city of Chicago's recommended list of street trees no longer includes the state tree of Illinois, the white oak, which is on the decline. The results, Chicago is substituting white oak street trees with white swamp oaks and bald cypress as part of the city's ongoing process to make sure they are as resilient as they can be when facing climate change in the future. 
So in complex situations, such as the replacement and replanting of trees in our streets or parks, or the management of an iconic panoramic view, who gets to decide? As KQED scientists reported recently this past June, the Tasmanian blue gum eucalyptus, eucalyptus globulus, a symbol of California for some, never quite knew California soil before 1850. Today there is a plan to remove tens of thousands of eucalyptus and other non-native trees from the East Bay Hills to reduce fire risk. The non-natives, primarily eucalyptus, Monterey pine, and acacia, under the FEMA's pre-disaster mitigation and hazard mitigation programs, would cover just under 1,000 acres and includes plans to encourage the regrowth of native oaks and bay trees. It is revealing to see that the first public comments posted on the essay by freelance science writer Liza Gross proclaims, thanks for this excellent article. Unfortunately, the position of ridding the hills of this invasive species is far more organized than the science-based FEMA proposals. What do you think of that? If this is hard to wrap your head around, even after the 15 fires that have been documented that have roared through 9,000 acres of East Bay Hills between 1923 and 1992, incinerating some 4,000 homes and killing 26 people, what happens if we attempt to take on something more challenging on the historic preservation side of the debate for those used to dealing with material culture beyond permanent built and natural features what about our own human emotional responses that are stimulated by sounds or soundscapes in the park? As the NPS has pointed out, some areas of the park provide visitors with natural quiet. This is the condition attained when a person with normal hearing can hear nothing but the sound produced by the natural components of the park. It may include silence, the apparent absence of any sound, or the rush of air over the wings of a soaring bird, the gentle swish of the wind in the trees, or the overwhelming crash and roar of the ocean on a stormy day. Most often, it is thought of as a mixture of mostly low decibel background sounds punctuated by the calls and clatter of wildlife. While much of the park is no longer naturally quiet, it may be critical to the wildlife to minimize anthropogenic sound. Aircraft, watercraft, road traffic outside the park all contribute to noise levels within the park. Noise generated inside the park includes not only visitor noise, but noise generated by park staff. Studies to quantify ambient noise within the park and the value of natural quiet need to be incorporated into park planning, operations, and interpretation. Take, for example, the recent New York Times opinion column, The Sound of a Damaged Habitat. Here, musician and naturalist Bernie Krauss notes that while a picture may be worth a thousand words, a soundscape is worth a thousand pictures. Krauss defines a soundscape as containing three basic sources. The geophony, which includes all non-biological natural sounds like wind or babbling streams. The biophony, which embraces the biological wild, non-human sounds that emanate from environments. And the anthropony, man-made sounds, which in a city like San Francisco is often referred to as noise. Noise, noise, noise. <laughs> so then, what role does a soundscape play in the stewardship and management of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area? How can soundscapes help us illuminate and interpret the vital signs of life at one end of the spectrum while we plan for the effects of human noise at the other? Let's consider Krauss's quest for his ideal, the intact creative chorus, but let's do so through the lens of the National Register, seven aspects or qualities of a historic integrity, namely location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. Looking closely at the feeling of the National Register Bulletin Guidelines notes, the feeling is the quality that a historic property has in evoking the aesthetic or historic sense of a past period or time. Although it is in self intangible, feeling is dependent upon the aid's significant physical characteristics that characterize its historic qualities. Integrity of feeling is enhanced by the continued use of a historic optic or sound signal at a light station, the characteristic flashing signal of light adds to its integrity. While sounds themselves, such as the buah of a diaphragm, cannot be nominated, I rehearsed that, it didn't come off well, did it? <laughs> cannot be nominated to the National Register, they, however, enhance the integrity of feeling. The mournful call of foghorns on San Francisco Bay is an integral part of experiencing life there. Although soundscapes are usually absent from many historic preservation studies, there is much more social media chatter about these topics here in Northern California in relation to the park and its setting. 
Here are a pair of examples. Research has long suggested that wildlife and birds, in particular, may be impacted by the man-made sounds of the city. A 2012 study by David Luther and Elizabeth Derryberry published in Animal Behavior confirms that sparrows in the Presidio district appear to have changed their tune and raised their voices to be heard over the increasingly noisy racket of the Golden Gate Bridge. The two write that it's probably good news for these sparrows that they figured out how to adapt. But there's also something sort of disturbing about the implication that cities can distort the natural environment right down to birdsong. In some ways, noise matters, even more for birds than it does for humans. Birds sing to defend their territory and to attract mates, two of life's most important goals, and excessive noise threatens that. Now, did you know that the classic nighttime ribbit, heard in movies and television for decades, comes from a diminutive two-inch West Coast native frog called the Sierran tree frog, also commonly called the Pacific chorus frog? Well. Good luck hearing them, though. If you're in the city today, their chorus is mostly restricted to entertainment offerings. As with the city's 20th century expansion, their habitat, vernal pools of the Mission District were filled in, pushing the frogs to the brink of disappearance. As Carmen Taylor reported just last month in Bay Nature, chorus frogs aren't a species of particular concern elsewhere. There will be no federal effort to restore them and protect their habitat in San Francisco, but as late as the 1990s, they were common here. And as such, that's reason enough to try to bring them back. Here again is that pesky third rail. Taylor notes, for some residents, the small frogs are less than lovable in an urban setting. The frogs have a prolonged breeding season that can last for several months, and most breeding occurs at night. Males sit near the water's edge, using different vocalizations to communicate with other males and females, so neighbors are privy to the frog's affections. They might be small, but you don't get Hollywood fame without the ability to make serious noise. The frogs are also heard chirping in with car alarms, crooning along with late night jam sessions, and croaking with passing trains. So when you're considering the park's dynamic ecosystem, one that encompasses a UNESCO-designated biodiversity hotspot, let alone five National Historic Landmarks and 12 National Register properties, what should be the criteria that we apply to guide and manage change? How do we measure success? What is our role in the education and strategic communications messaging when engaging the public, not to mention a highly charged political arena? How can our work promote acts of self-discovery, amplify those lingering human echoes, and manifest themselves in the managed cultural landscapes of the park in all of its rich, glorious, messy, and sometimes even ugly manifestations? If you're a steward, a landscape architect, horticulturalist, ecologist, naturalist, or interpreter dealing with a nationally significant landscape such as the park, how do you measure, leverage, prioritize, perhaps even monetize a landscape's natural, scenic, cultural, ethnographic, environmental, ecological, educational, spiritual, and interpretive values while also balancing its carrying capacity with the visitor experience? As Jeff Cape of Toronto's Evergreen questions, how can we inspire to build a culture of nature through citizen engagement and big and small ideas for an urbanizing world. Looking deeper, a pattern is suggested by many of today's speakers' abstracts, with consensus surrounding the idea that a healthy ecosystem is easy to build consensus for. However, as Peter Del Tredici notes, urban ecosystems are the ultimate manifestation of the dynamic conflict between humans and nature, between our desire for neat and orderly landscapes on the one hand and the messiness and chaos of climate change ecology on the other. He goes on, and here's where it gets juicy, for better or worse, the vegetation of our cities is as cosmopolitan as its human population and, quite frankly, is better adapted to unnatural ecosystems than the native species that once grew here. So, to advance such an agenda, how much and what type of public interaction is desired? How do we balance restoring and maintaining cities and parks for nature's sake while promoting public interaction with both the natural and built environments? Through the collective experience of today's speakers representing public, private, nonprofit, and academic sectors, not to mention such diverse backgrounds as science, social science, journalism, biology, plant propagation, environmental studies, landscape architecture, art, architecture, regional planning, and public engagement, our hope is to both put forward best practices and lessons learned while sparking a lively discourse. Today, in both the public and private arena, we hear all too often that there are limited resources that challenge and stress the ongoing treatment and management of our nation's cultural landscapes. But I would argue that if this situation was to be made more transparent and richly interpreted for the visiting public, perhaps then the nature-culture interface could move forward 
and in the process could yield educated, less segmented, more fully engaged, con engaged constituencies beyond the decaf soy milk ambassadors. <laughs> As the NPS has noted, the US Army is the reason the Presidio is like an environmental lifeboat. The Army focused construction in only certain areas. The rest of the undeveloped land was left undeveloped. Because it was a military base, civilian access was also limited. The native plants and animals were protected as a byproduct of military priorities. Here nature was allowed to take its course. But what does this really mean? In seeking answers to this sentiment, I challenge our speakers today to address what this concept means to them. Bob Cook, the former director of Harvard's Arnold Arboretum in his paper, Is Landscape Preservation an Oxymoron? notes that as a plant ecologist, the parts of the landscape that interest him the most are the very aspects that avoid preservation. He notes that plants and the animals and wildlife associated with them grow, move around, reproduce, die, and generally bring the landscape to a very uncooperative tendency to change. He goes so far as to suggest that a successful effort at preservation would seem to require its own failure. So what then should stewards preserve today? Finally, a personal note to end with. On the occasion of Biltmore Centennial some time ago, I helped to organize a conference that reappraised Olmsted's design for the Biltmore estate. At that conference, Robert Melnick, who did much preservation planning work here at the Presidio in the early 1990s, gave an opening address titled, Moving Towards the Middle in a World of Extremes, which drew heavily on his decades of experience with the nature culture divide with large complex landscapes of the West like Yosemite. In preparing for today's conference, I went back to Melnick's paper, where he suggested three linguistic and landscape frames, semantic ecotones, landscape differentials, and looking at the landscape as teacher, perhaps a nod back to Freeman Tilden. In trying to position his three-pronged approach as a bridge in the nature culture debate, Melnick applies the idea of semantic ecotones as being akin to ecological systems representing, quote, a most fruitful opportunity for diverse and rich consideration of a variety of landscapes. He suggested this idea could serve as a model for recognizing that thought, ideas, and actions, much like landscapes, are complex construction of overlapping layers, and that all too often, land management agencies and those charged with natural and cultural landscape preservation are invested in a construct which emphasizes the landscape differentials at the expense of commonalities and potentials, and thereby entrenches and polarizes opinion. One only need read a newspaper today to see Melnick nails the situation when we consider how the American lawn has become a dirty word. From the First Lady's vegetable garden that is plopped in the middle of the Olmsted Brothers design for the White House grounds to his dear escape solution that will jeopardize the future of Governor's Mansion in Boise. What I like much about the idea of semantic ecotones is its foundational principle is borrowed from the ecological concept of ecotone. Namely, the transition between two different plant or ecological communities. I believe our challenge today is to understand and acknowledge that our way of looking at landscape is distinguished by our own university experiences, followed by our professional practice toolkits. From the object-centric Secretary of the Interior Standards, which keeps natural resource values at a comfortable distance, to the ASLA's own Sustainable Sites Initiative, which emphasizes environmental and green resource solutions, often overlooking historic and cultural values. Perhaps by acknowledging these selective barriers and recognizing the cultural landscapes like the parks are inadequately served by a single classification system, that in the process we endorse, experiment with, and codify personal and professional solutions that allow the landscape to teach us. Nature can be unpredictable. As much as we like to think they do, plants, like animals, don't stay put. They move, and the results are evidenced in the rich and complex natural, cultural, and ecological mosaic that is the park. Thank you.